Coming up on Southern Remedy. It was one of those things you think, oh, that'll never happen to me. It was like being in the pits of hell. I had to fight for my daughter. Oh my, this is bug heaven. Unbelievable, one dip. That's one dip in a busted sewer pipe ditch. One dip, there's probably 500 to 1,000 mosquito larvae. Hello and welcome to this version of Southern Remedy. Today our topic is West Nile virus and our goal is information. We want to bring you up to date about this health issue and give you the tools you need to stay safe and healthy. This is the first of monthly medical updates featuring topics in the news important to Mississippians. We hope you will join us as we make this effort each month and let us know if there are topics you would like to know about. But today, we start with West Nile virus. We're going to give you the straight facts about West Nile virus and its effects on Mississippi. Almost every single person that gets it in our state gets it from a mosquito bite. And when they get West Nile virus, they get different types of illnesses or no illness at all. Some people may feel like they have a cold and some people can die. Of people who are infected with the virus, about 20% become ill. Of those, the Centers for Disease Control suggests that 1% develop severe disease with symptoms like fever, headache, fatigue, back pain, muscle aches, decreased appetite and rash, and the symptoms can last from a few days to several weeks. A small percentage of people develop extreme problems when the virus infects the brain and spinal cord. Up to this point, Mississippi has had 236 reported cases of West Nile virus. The highest number of cases have been reported in Rankin County at 45, with Madison and Hines counties tied at 24. People older than 50 and those with compromised immune systems are most at risk. West Nile's effects on people are vast and unpredictable. Crystal Wally was a normal 30-something year old going about her life until she was bitten by a mosquito. Here is her story. That week, I just remember going to work every day and just feeling horrible. Like, I, I didn't have any physical symptoms, but I felt so tired. As soon as I would get off work, I would be in bed at like 3.30, 4 o'clock, and I'd stay in bed till the next morning. Well, then I noticed, um, a rash on my upper chest and upper back. The next day she called and said, Mama, I went to work today, but I just didn't feel like I could, I mean, I could hardly drag myself anywhere. I felt so bad. And I said, well, honey, maybe you're just totally run down. You've been doing so much lately. And I went and ran into my ER doctor and he was like, well, you've definitely got something viral going on. Just let it run its course. Well, the next day I woke up and I had a lot of swollen lymph nodes in my neck and throat. and. That was probably a Thursday or Friday, and that Saturday I started vomiting profusely and just thought I had a bad stomach virus. So I went back to the ER. They um, gave me some fluids, sent me back home, and I think it was Sunday I continued to be sick and started running fever. The next morning, she literally, when she got up, she said, I can't see, Mama, I'm the room. I just can't see anything. The, the vertigo had set in at that point, so we went back to the emergency room and they admitted her. And uh, the, the vomiting got so bad that she literally was throwing up blood. To be honest, I don't remember a lot after that. I remember waking up one time, um, I was still in Wayne General, and I remember not being able to feel my right arm. I remember hallucinating a lot. I can remember seeing things and I would tell my mom and she'd assure me that Oh, it was just something I was seeing. Wednesday morning, her right arm was totally paralyzed and she was talking out of her head. I mean, she was seeing things. She was, you know, the fever started climbing. It was like 102.5 then. This horrible pain started. She got like a Bell's palsy in her face. 
she couldn't, her mouth was affected, her eyes wouldn't shut, and it seemed the per, where, where she had been able to put weight on her legs, like her legs were now becoming like spaghetti noodles. The only thing that she could do was move the fingers of her left hand, and she could turn her head from side to side. She couldn't lift it, she could turn it. Uh, she was literally for three weeks before we left there, she was taking pain medication every two hours. She said the pain, it felt like she was laying in a bed of glass. Three different nights during that time, I have to tell you, I, I thought she was going to not make it. She, um, it's her, her, her breathing, her uh, everything. I mean, it was just like everything was shutting down. It was like being in the pits of hell. I remember the ride. I remember it was very painful, but yet in an awkward way, it kind of was relief because I think I was in so much pain and I can still remember riding in the ambulance and hitting bumps. It was just like movement to my body because I had been, you know, laid as a vegetable for so long. I think it was just kind of gave me a sign of hope actually to be out of the hospital and being transferred to Jackson. When we got to Jackson, they started her on a path toward whatever recovery we could get and to life, to going home to be able to take care of herself as much as she could. I pretty much came off most of my pain medication when I got to Jackson and reality set in that I couldn't move. I mean, for the first five or six weeks, I don't remember a lot about it, but when I got to Jackson, I remember crying every day, probably 22 hours, had the 24 hours a day, um, I had pretty much realized what was going on and the reality of it, what it had done to me. She cried, like she said, nonstop. She cried all day, every day, thinking that, you know, this life, well, I don't have a life, you know. I, I, you know, I mean, all of it just came crushing in on her. My therapist, my doctors never would say, you're gonna be better, you're gonna be well, you know. It was all, let's just take it day by day and let's work hard at this and we're just gonna take it day by day. And I can remember a lot of the nurses came in and um, actually one of them came in to us and she told our family that um, the doctors don't hear, heal here, Jesus does. And she said, we'll pray with you every day. And she said, we'll do everything we can to get you back to where you can have a functional life with your family. Things, were, things weren't easy when we got back. I mean, but she was so, coming home was like medicine for her. I was so depressed because, you know, whenever I got sick, I just thought I had a virus and went to the hospital. And three months later, I'm paralyzed and had not been back home. So when I got home, I was just, I mean, it was, you know, I can't even explain it. It was, I think the best thing that could have happened to me was send me home and get me back in my environment to where I want to get up and clean up and wash my dishes. And, you know, it took six or seven months before I could even do any kind of housework. And, you know, just but having that desire and having that want to, to take care of my family again was something that I'll never forget. Well, the, the, when we got back home, um, the little church that she goes to, um, the pastor, Brother Gandy, was just awesome. He assembled a group of men. They came out here. They had a ramp built for us when we got home. He was the one that had a power chair borrowed here waiting for us. She couldn't do, a, she had no movement to be able to move herself. You know, so a power chair was a wonderful thing for us, for her. For her to be able to do the fingers, you know, she could move the fingers of her left hand so she could do the little control on the power chair, which gave her some autonomy. Every day is just, I'm happy. Just every day, my whole life, outlook on life is different. And it's the little things that I always took for granted. I mean, just like taking my daughter to school and picking her up at Carbell and, you know, being able to participate or wash dishes and wash their clothes or cook for them. I mean, the smallest things that whenever they're taken away, you don't realize that so many people say, oh, I gotta do laundry and I gotta cook supper, but whenever you're unable to do it for your family, it's, you don't realize 
how much you actually miss. It was over a year before I actually felt like I was going to be well or felt like I was going to have a life that was going to be more functional. And I think I suffered a lot with just, you know, just being so depressed and so hard on myself. I mean, you know, you of course you feel like a burden and you feel like you're just in everybody's way and then you start thinking, well, you shouldn't have been here. Maybe it'd been easier on everybody if I wasn't here. But then you wake up, I mean, and you kind of realize, you know, you got two little girls that need you, and you got a husband and a mom, and you have a family that needs you, and just never give up, keep trying. I had to fight for my daughter. I, as I told her, um, she can't give up. I'm gonna fight, I'll fight for you until you're able to fight for yourself. And so, you know, I had to be her advocate. Um, and would do it again. I mean, I, I, it doesn't matter how old your children get, they're always your babies, you know. <laughs> we still go and do, I think I'm way more precautious of my children and everything worries me about them, but not so much myself. I'm pretty much just kind of, I guess, over it maybe you'd say. <laughs> I, I'm thankful. You just have no idea how thankful. One day you're walking around okay working and a mosquito bites you and literally tries to rob your life and all quality of life, all functionality of life. I mean, from a mosquito bite, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to wrap your brain around, but when you see it and you real, I mean, it just, it's unreal. And a mosquito bite. There's still plenty more ahead, including a look at where West Nile is. Believe it or not, the illness isn't lurking in the woods or at the lake. It's much closer to home. And then later, we'll be joined by one of the country's foremost experts on the disease. We'll find out where the research is and why there isn't yet a vaccine. Stay with us. When you make a film, what we don't do is make a film about something we already know about. It's about something we want to know about. And so for us, making the film is a perpetual, I didn't know that, I didn't realize that. And The Dust Bowl is one of the most satisfying stories in that it is so much owned by the more than two dozen people that we found who could describe as children, as teenagers, though they are now in their 80s and 90s, what it was like for 10 years of this horrific apocalypse. It really was. The people who went through this, first of all, are old now because this took place in the 1930s. So they're pretty hardy folks because they've already lived that long a life. They grew up in a rural place where life is hard anyway. But through the hardest of hard times, the, the Dust Bowl and the Depression simultaneously laid over their young lives. Our anxiety is, would there be people left? Would there be enough sort of critical mass to make it happen? We set out appeals through local PBS stations. Hi, I'm Ken Burns, and I'm asking you to help me with a new public television series I'm now working on, The Dust Bowl. We found a lot of people, and their collective stories began to suggest this kind of tsunami of complication to this. And we knew we had a film then. And, and that's that moment where you just say, wow, it, there's something here. My dad got laid off. It's tough because my mom and dad are poor. I live in a shelter. I wish I never lived here. My mom kind of made a wrong turn. I'm hungry. I know, so am I. I think when I get older, things are going to get harder than they are now. People don't realize what they have until it's gone. Tuesday at 9 on MPB. Summer and fall and maybe winter in Mississippi, they just come with mosquitoes. And in the past, that wasn't a big deal. But now that those mosquitoes might also come with West Nile virus, well, it's a lot scarier. So what should we worry about? Is it every mosquito or do special mosquitoes carry the virus? We ask an expert. <music> Yeah.
there's about 61 mosquito species in this state, but there's only, we think, one species that transmits West Nile virus, and it's mostly an urban mosquito that's around houses or patios or things like that, not way out in the deep woods. You probably won't get it out hunting or fishing or out in nature. A common lay person probably can't tell the mosquitoes apart other than big, little, black, brown, etc. The mosquito that transmits West Nile is a small brown mosquito. So right there, off the bat, that's one thing that's helpful. If you live in the Delta or somewhere, it's been a lot of rain and these big mosquitoes as big as a bird fly by or big as your fingernail and they have a shadow on the ground, that's not a West Nile mosquito. The main mosquito that transmits West Nile virus in Mississippi is the southern house mosquito, Culex quinquefasciatus. That's its name, Culex quinquefasciatus. Mosquito people just call them quinks. That's the mosquito that you should watch out for, for West Nile. This mosquito is a nighttime mosquito. Some mosquitoes bite in the day, but this mosquito is a nighttime mosquito. There's, there's very little chance you're going to be bitten by a West Nile carrying mosquito in the middle of the day. Very little chance. People look to oh, the pond or the lake or the reservoir and they say, they're coming from there, they're coming from the swamp. Well, they're not coming from the swamp. I mean, they maybe are, but this mosquito's not. This mosquito's breeding right around your house. Water should not, when it rains, should not come to the house and stand. Water should have a way of getting away. Bird baths, things like that, pet dishes, old tires, anything that can hold water for a week or so can breed mosquitoes. See that spot? See how dark that is? And especially if it gets some kind of organic matter in it and gets all grody and nasty, it's really good for mosquitoes. And that mosquito that carries West Nile in Mississippi loves thick organic water. That's one dip in a busted sewer pipe ditch. Gutters. Gutters on the house. If they're clogged, they can hold water and breed mosquitoes. So those are some of the main breeding sites around the house. Now, if you live out in the country and have an on-site wastewater system, septic tank, it needs to be functioning properly. If it's malfunctioning and the water that comes out of the other end is septic, doo-doo water, <laughs> they love it. They'll breed in that stuff. It should be clear. It should not be organic. If you have a failing wastewater system, it needs to be fixed so that the water that comes out is clear. And this can be, you can get help with this by going to the health department website or calling a county health department inspector. <music> Oddly, mosquitoes can breed in the urns and flower pots and things in a cemetery. People don't usually think about that. Storm drains are a mess. Storm drains can, can breed the mosquitoes that carry West Nile, especially in cities or towns where broken sewage pipes underground, the sewage seeps into the storm drains. There can be pots or places or spots of breeding of those mosquitoes and nobody knows it. From the surface everything looks fine, but there's really little pools or puddles of sewage water and they're breeding mosquitoes. If you are a homeowner and you live in a city and you see a broken pipe or smell sewage or suspect that there's broken pipes in your storm drain or in the ditch, I think you should call the Public Works Department or the Street Department and say, I think there's a broken pipe near my house. Can you come fix it? Standing water is bad. Standing water with a lot of organic matter is worse. Get rid of it. Dump it out. 
If you can't dump it out, treat it. You can go to a home and garden store and get these little larvicide packets or dunks or briquettes that you put in the water. You can use repellents. You can spray your skin with repellents. Use it according to the directions. Whatever the directions say, that's what you do. People don't understand that. How often it can be reapplied is all on the label. Also, certain mosquito repellents, certain ones can only be sprayed on the clothing, and they'll say that. Others are for skin, some are for clothing, so you gotta read the, the label on all of that. Just try to keep yourself from being bitten by mosquitoes. You can wear long sleeves, long pants. You know, people say, well, I don't wanna wear long sleeves. Well, the more you cover up, the less you have to slather up. Another thing you could do would just be behavioral. You know, well, there's a lot of mosquitoes in that patch of woods or this time of year. Just avoid it. If you just went out in nature and caught, say, 10,000 mosquitoes, maybe one might happen. Maybe two. I don't know. It depends on where you are in the state. It depends on what time of the year. There's some seasonality to it. So it's really a numbers game. It's like one out of ever so many thousand. So the bottom line is, if you get bitten by a lot of mosquitoes, the chances are you're going to get bit by one with West Nile. Of course, you could get bit by one mosquito and get West Nile. Mosquitoes can carry diseases. This is just one. There's a lot of diseases they can carry. The message is the same. Protect yourself from mosquito bites as much as you can. Don't get all weird about it and don't ever go outside and try to live in a bubble. But protect yourself as much as you can when you're working outdoors in the summer months. Wow, plenty of information there that I know we will all want to remember. Up next, answers to a lot of questions I know you have. We'll have Dr. Art Lace, an expert, from vaccines to causes to what we can expect next year. We'll ask him anything we can come up with. Stay with us. It feels like something's out there. It could rip a hole in the universe. I bring you two billion light years from Earth, and you want to update Twitter. Stop Twitter! This is your fault! We're bringing her out of the then and into the now. Not much of a captain without a ship, are you? Saturday at 9 on MPB. Can I eat that? Oh, no! Tastes like larva. What's cooking deep inside your dinner? A lot of chemistry's going on in there. And your mind. The perception of flavor is created by the brain. Surprising secrets of why we eat the things we do. This is really scientific. <laughs> Meat stick rat puppets. Impressive and disgusting. You definitely look like a super taster. On Nova Science Now. Wednesday at 9 on MPB. So far today, we've heard from people who have had West Nile, and we've heard about how to avoid West Nile, but what about the future of West Nile in Mississippi? Clearly, it's something we need to be thinking about. Joining me now is Dr. Art Lace, Senior Scientist at Methodist Rehabilitation Center here in Jackson, and an expert on West Nile virus. He's made inroads into this disease and major contributions to the understanding and treatment of it. Crystal Wally, the woman we profiled earlier was a patient of his. Dr. Lakes, let's start out with where we are with this disease. What are the alarm signs that would make someone want to seek medical attention? In a nutshell, it is a summer flu. Any type of viral uh, summer uh, uh, infection uh, where patients uh, have fever, uh, chills, nausea, vomiting, uh, and particularly if it's associated with uh, confusion uh, and any type of neurological deficits. Uh, in, in fact, any summer uh, illness that is associated with, with any type of neurological disease uh, should be considered uh, to have uh, West Nile virus in the differential diagnosis. Okay, so when should you be referred to an outside facility other than a local hospital with this problem? Well, I, I don't think an outside uh, referral is, is, is necessary unless they develop neurological deficits. 
This is a very neuroinvasive virus, and it can cause meningitis uh, or encephalitis or even poliomyelitis. Uh, and, and meningitis is simply just the inflammation of the lining around the spinal cord in the brain. The encephalitis, the, the virus actually attacks and begins to destroy brain cells. And in poliomyelitis, it attacks the gray matter of the spinal cord uh, that houses the cells that give rise to the motor fibers that control our, all our movement. I know that you're doing active research in this area. Where is that taking us? Well, we're actually looking at uh, a number of uh, issues with West Nile virus. Uh, one of the things we started noticing in 2002 uh, was that there were a lot of patients who had West Nile fever, which is considered a relatively benign summer flu. But we were seeing a lot of patients who had prolonged uh, symptoms, recurrent symptoms. Uh, many had fatigue, disabling fatigue, even a year later. Uh, and so we, we started looking at that group and we found that a relatively high proportion of those patients actually had evidence of damage to their brain or spinal cord. Uh, and, and we were able to document that by looking at proteins that had leaked out of the brain and spinal cord uh, that were then found in the patient's serum. So it appears that you're working on early diagnostic techniques to help figure out who is going to have the simple West Nile fever versus the neurological illnesses, and how would that be applied? Yeah, I think we're, we're helping to clarify who has neuroinvasive disease and who has simply a milder form, the, the West Nile fever. Uh, and uh, this year, for example, in 2012, we have 5,000 cases and a little over half, 51% of those are neuroinvasive. Wow, that's much larger than we thought. Uh, it, it, it is uh, much larger. and. Uh, the, the initial uh, studies that suggested only 1% have neuroinvasive disease uh, were based on a small population-based study that was uh, uh, reflected the 1999 New York City outbreak. Uh, and, and we think we, this, this, this information should probably be updated. But 51% uh, uh, did have neuroinvasive disease and 49% had the West Nile fever. And what we're trying to do is uh, develop some biomarkers that will reflect who indeed is developing uh, the West Nile virus attack on their brain and their spinal cords. Well, thank you for your work and thanks for being in Mississippi. We you're, appreciate it. You're welcome. I want to thank Dr. Lace and all of you for being a part of the show today. If you missed any part of the program, it'll be posted shortly at www.southernremedy.org. If you have any questions or for us, you can always drop us an email at southernremedy at mpbonline.org. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.